two Democrats hoping to unseat Representative Maria Elvira Salazar in Congress, but first they needed to win in Tuesday's primary election. State Senator Annette Tadeo and Commissioner Ken Russell sat down with Jackie to talk about their campaign and what they can bring to the table. And here's what they had to say. Senator Tadeo, thank you so much for joining us here, as always, on NBC6 Impact. My pleasure. The last time I saw you, you were planning on running for the Democratic primary in the gubernatorial race, and now you're running for Congress. What happened there, and would you say this is a better fit for you? Well, listen, what happened is the reality that I was the only candidate in the primary that had to go through session uh, without being allowed to raise money, had to go through a uh, couple of subsequent special sessions without being allowed to raise money. And although before we got into session, we had raised a million dollars, the reality is that we knew that in order for people to hear about me and hear my message with the name recognition deficit, uh, that that was uh, not going to happen without being able to raise the resources necessary to do that. Uh, but I had a conversation with my daughter after Uvalde happened, and it really was, uh, I was taken aback by her encouragement to get into this race. I was getting the calls for community leaders and, uh, and other people, but really it was that conversation with my daughter, what happened in Uvalde, and knowing that uh, we need a voice and we need a true representative in Washington that's going to represent the best interests of all of the District 27 residents. And that is what I plan on doing. Well, you mentioned, Uvalde, gun violence is something that's near and dear to your heart. I was with you and Gabby Giffords on her mission against gun violence just a few months ago. Florida, as you know, has the red flag laws. And on a federal level, Congress passed the bipartisan gun legislation. Are you satisfied with that first gun reform bill in decades? Listen, it's a step in the right direction and absolutely uh, really uh, sad that it takes these kinds of events for anything to get done. But it, it really is necessary for us to do so much more. I am the daughter of an American fighter pilot, and my dad taught me how to shoot a gun and taught me how to respect guns. And uh, the fact that we have weapons of war out there on the streets allowed uh, such an AR-15, which is the weapon of choice for all these mass shootings, is really not okay, which is why I've always been a sponsor of banning assault weapons, and I will continue in that fight in Washington. The Climate Tax and Healthcare Bill, or the Inflation Reduction Act, passed. This was a win for Democrats, but Republicans say this is not the time for this type of legislation when inflation is affecting Americans at a record pace, and it will have a negative impact on Americans. How do you respond to that? Uh, it won't have a ne negative impact on regular Americans. It might have an impact on billionaires, but certainly not on regular folk who are actually the ones suffering, who are actually the ones who have been feeling it. And this is exactly what we need to do, is to pass bills like this to reduce the deficit, which we have already been seeing. We've already been seeing the reduction of the gas price. We've already been seeing all of the things that the Democrats have been doing to try to reduce, which is not what we have been seeing from our current representative. She is voting against uh, price gouging for gas, voting against putting more baby milk on, on the shelves, voting against uh, making sure that people have insulin at a $35 maximum. This is against everything that our community deserves as a representative. So what else would you suggest to help Americans now that are really struggling to just go to the grocery store to buy food to put on their tables? Listen, the inflation issue is a global issue. It's not just a United States issue. And we obviously know that some of this came about because of COVID and many of the uh, factories and the places uh, not being able to uh, keep up once we were all back in our cars, back at, at work, back uh, into somewhat of a normalcy. And we need to make sure that we do everything in our power, which is what these bills have done. With the overturning of Roe v. Wade, do you believe the decision should be up to the states? As you know, Florida has an abortion ban after 15 weeks. 
I believe that we need to codify Roe v. Wade at the federal level. There needs to be a, a, a bill and that is uh, voted and that we have a representative that is actually going to vote with our community. Look, many of us come from places where the government tells us what to do. And the last thing we need is like we right now have with a representative that is not only not voting to codify Roe v. Wade, but also voting to not allow a woman to travel across state lines. I can't believe that I'm even saying it, but that is what we have right now, and that is completely unacceptable. Your experience in the state Senate, how do you believe that could help you on a federal level? How can you make a difference on a federal level because it's a whole different ball game? It is, and I will tell you, as someone who went to the state Senate and, and, and got elected, surprising, winning a, a race nobody thought I could win, and then getting reelected, I can tell you that what I'm the proudest of is the fact that I worked across the aisle, that I gained the respect, not just of my colleagues on the Democratic side, but of my colleagues on the Republican side. You have received several big endorsements from unions and community leaders, and even the Miami Herald, which says you have the best chance of flipping the seat. You mentioned you have worked across the aisle to bring about good legislation, as you said. They say you have been battle-tested and can build a coalition. Why do you think that you can continue to do that in Washington? Well, look, uh, there is no telling what can happen as far as who's going to have control uh, of Washington, whether it's, you know, the Congress or the Senate changes hands, all of that is on the line. But I will say that what's on the line is our democracy. Uh, look, we have January 6th that we all have been, have watched and were shocked, especially those of us who come from other countries. We never thought we'd see this on U.S. soil. And to have a representative who doesn't think we need to get to the bottom of it, who voted against the January 6th committee, who continues to be silent about the Proud Boys being a part of the Republican Executive Committee of Miami-Dade County, that is completely unacceptable. We cannot bring about change in other other countries and democracy in Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, if you're not willing to fight for democracy right here on our soil. But even before you can get to Washington, you still have to get through the primary. Why do you believe you are a better candidate than your opponent to run against a Republican incumbent? Well, first of all, because I am the strongest candidate in the general and I can I can actually win and I have been battle tested, like the Miami Herald said, in very tough races. Look, they have tried everything against me. They 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 called to me all the names that they usually call Democrats and it didn't work because of the fact that I am now known. I am somebody that is a small business owner that uh, fled to come to the United States after my father was kidnapped by the FARC. So these kind of attacks with socialist, communist, all the things that they try against us have not worked against me, and I will succeed. State Senator Aneta Deo, as always, thank you so much for joining us. Good luck. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Commissioner Russell, thank you so much for joining us on NBC6 Impact. Thanks for having me, Jackie. Good to see you again. So the first time I interviewed you, back in 2015, you were a business owner small business owner, and there were problems with some of the parks in the community, and you wanted to make a change, you wanted to make a difference, so you decided to run for city commission, and you won, and then you won re-election, and now you're running for Congress. This is, this is something entirely different. You're going from city politics to federal politics. That's a big step. You considered it before and then didn't do it, and now you're going full-blown for this seat. Do you think this time is the charm? Well, well, what a ride it's been at the city of Miami. I'm finishing my second term now, and everything I've learned, it's, there's so much you can do in local, local government, and it's very fulfilling. Uh, coming from just being a, a neighborhood environmental parks activist to now working on affordable housing and police oversight and good government initiatives, infrastructure, storm surge, sea level rise, these are all things that we've moved during the city of Miami's uh, last two terms uh, that I'm very proud of, but we've done it without the help of the federal government. The federal government plays a huge role in the big things we need to accomplish as a city. And as the second largest city in the state, we should be right at the top of their list when it comes to storm surge and sea level rise and water quality issues. But there's no connection. I want to be that connection. I want to be the federal representative I wish I had for the last seven years, but not just for the city of Miami, for the whole region. Your opponent has served on the state Senate, 
Annette Tadeo. The Miami Herald recently said that she has the best chance of flipping the seat. Obviously, you think you can do that as well. We are both running against Maria Elvira Salazar, a freshman Republican who's getting primary from the right. They're even calling her a socialist. The word has lost its meaning. What Democrat is ready to stand up and win this seat back for Democrats in the region? I believe I understand what needs to be done. And it's not about emulating Maria Elvira Salazar. And that's what the Democratic Party has done. The establishment has anointed Annette to where there's an assumption that she's already won the seat. But there's a real race going on underneath, and I'm used to being the underdog. So yes, the residents are looking for someone different, someone of something of change, someone they can relate to who gets things done. And that's what I've done. Well, you're both Democrats. What would you say are some of the biggest differences between both of you in this primary race? There are two big differences. The main one is accomplishment. I don't talk about what I believe in or what I fight for. I talk about what I've done. And in the last seven years, I've passed more ordinances than everyone in this race combined, both the primary and the general. And I've done so in the minority on a very rough and tumble City of Miami Commission. But yet, I've passed $400 million in a general obligation bond without raising taxes for infrastructure and affordable housing. I've passed big zoning ordinances to mandate affordable housing and new construction. And I've passed the most aggressive environmental laws to protect our tree canopy and our waters. Annette Tadeo cannot speak to any of those. In fact, the other difference is she's on the other side of the environment. Uh, from myself. She's taken huge contributions from the big sugar industry and FPL, and she's turned around and voted in their favor and against the environment. For example, the tree ordinance that I strengthened, that I wrote in the city of Miami that allows the city of Miami to really protect our canopy, has now been preempted by the state on, on an item that, on a, on a bill that, that Annette Teo voted for, allowing uh, the state government to preempt and, and eliminate all city tree protections. And that's exactly the opposite of what we're trying to do. Let local governments do what they do best. Um, she's also voted against the water and the air in favor of big sugar. So we have huge differences that I think the voters should know about. There's a lot of give and take that, that it takes to pass legislation. And when you're talking about Washington politics even more so, do you think that if you were to be in that position, you could cross the line and negotiate with the other side. Absolutely. And it's not about going to the center or diluting your position or giving in and compromise. It's about consensus. And so my campaign, you don't hear me talk about Donald Trump in January 6th. As important as these issues are, my campaign is about affordable housing and clean water. Now, those aren't centrist issues. Those are global issues. We have a huge crisis on both here in South Florida. And when I speak to those issues and the accomplishments I've had and what I'm going to do in Congress, that resonates with the voters. There has been an issue that we have been reporting on in the past several weeks and months, and that is homelessness in the city of Miami. And there was debate back and forth as to what to do with the homeless population right now. Um, some people wanted to build tiny homes on Virginia Key. You were against it. As a matter of fact, you protested against it. Why? So the homeless people are people first and homeless second. You can't just dump them somewhere. You can't arrest them in our parks and drop them off on an island. It's the most inhumane thing you can think of without a solution or a path forward. It's just hiding the problem. We can solve the problem of homelessness. It's not to say we don't have a problem, but the city of Miami is one of the best in the country when it comes to homelessness and a large city. There was over 1,000 in the streets when I first came to office. There's 500 now. 500 homeless people can be housed, can be sheltered, and get their get themselves into their first key and a job if we get them on the right path. We have that path, we have the right partners, but this was not the right plan. There are so many issues facing South Florida residents right now. And for your constituents, what would you say, because we've talked about a lot of the problems, what would you say is the most important issue right now facing your constituents? The rent, housing costs. Right now, the city of Miami and South Florida is the least affordable place in the entire country, and it shouldn't be that way. We have an amazing population, a very diverse workforce here, who's finding it harder and harder to pay the rent. While a lot of people focus on gas prices, the biggest chunk of your, sa your salary every month is going to rent, and more of everyone's salary here goes to their rent than anywhere else in the country. So the solutions that I've created at the city of Miami have to do with zoning, subsidy, development partnerships, and land to create those units of housing and to preserve existing affordable housing. But again, that federal partner has been missing. If I touch any of my projects with a HUD dollar from the, the Housing and Urban Development, it ruins the project because the policies they have in place make it so hard to spend here for the people that need it. So that's something I really want to work on in the federal government, and, and it's definitely movable. It's a fixable problem. We talked about the campaign, and you have said that you have to do the work. But you've also done some interesting campaigning as well. And I'm talking about TikTok. 
Many of your TikToks have gone viral. So I want to know who came up with this idea and have you had help from your daughters? Well, my, my son has given me some good ideas your on son, TikTok. Right? Yeah, I have two daughters and a son and they're all into TikTok, but they, they I've put them to shame. I've just passed 10 million likes and 400,000 wow. dedicated followers. A lot of them are across the country. The question is, are they motivating voters in this district? And are they voting, motivating people of voting age uh, and inclination? Or is it just kids on their dancing? I really believe there's something happening there and I believe a lot of people our age Jackie are also lurking on TikTok and really learning and enjoying things so I've connected with an audience uh, we'll see in the next couple weeks if it makes a difference well good luck to you once again Commissioner thank you so much for joining us. thank you Jackie